Workshop Shop has a website. It's Daniel Shakovi Machado, which is my name, dot weeksite dot com slash PSU 21. And if you come here, you're going to notice that we only have two tabs, uh, homepage and the RNA sequencing playlist. And here you're going to find a few selected videos. I spent some time thinking about uh, putting together this kind of short suggestion of very, very fast lessons that are easy to follow, even if you don't know anything about RNA sequencing and that can put you towards the, the right direction. Today's workshop is going to be about kind of practical exercises in, what, in which I want to, to show you actual data, RNA sequencing data, and some examples of how we can make that work. So I put together this small image, which is actually nine kilobytes long, and you have to upload into a virtual box machine. You can read the instructions about how to do that from here, and you can click here to download the image from my Google Drive. If you have any problems doing that, let me know. If you have not installed this image, and if you're not ready to use it right away, it's best for you to just follow what I'm doing and then try to uh, do the exercises by yourself at home. I already have this image loaded here in my screen, and we are going to start working on this directory in the desktop called Simple Kitmap. So in this directory, I have a table in comma separated values, CSV. Uh, I have a short script already uh, that I, I wrote that's prepared to run, it's ready to go. And I have a readme file, and you can always click on readme files and see what's inside. And the first thing we want to do is try to visualize some data and, and, and start slowly into checking out how this works. So this directories, they contain readme files that contain instructions. Uh, in this case, what we are going to see is a file uh, that contains gene expression for 100 genes over 10 time points. And both of these genes, they have the stable background expression level, but some special genes show increased expression over the time course, and some show decreased expression. So what we want to start doing with this data is to try to categorize the background expression level and identify special genes. We're not going to do it all. We're going to start in the generation of the first heat map, and then I'm going to move on to other exercises. But I leave this here so in order for you to be able to work and, and, and play out with the data later on if you want to. Okay? There are many ways that we can work on a terminal window. We are going to work in terminals a lot when we are doing bioinformatics. Um, and in Ubuntu, you can just right click the, the folder and you can open it on the terminal. Okay? This is my terminal window. Um, and if you never worked on this before, you're going to want to search for some very basic bash terms, bash comments that you can use. For example, ls. When you type ls, you list the contents of the directory where you are. If you want to check where you are, you can type pwd, path to work directory, and you can see where you are in the computer, right? So I'm already in the working directory, simple heat map because I right click at that folder and I asked to open the terminal window. Okay, let's take a look into the expression data. So when we are working on bioinformatics, often we have to read very large files. That's not the case here. All the files that I put here are examples that are very small. But let's imagine that we are working with real data, the files are potentially very large. One way for you to read a very large file is to use less so that you can read the file without using too much of your computer's memory. So the, the comment is less expression. And I just hit a tab. When you are working from the terminal window, you can just hit tab and it now it completes. So I hit enter and this is the table. So it's comma separated values. Each line, the first line is the header. Uh, and each line contains information about a different gene. This is going to be our input data here for this exercise. And later on, we are going to see how we can actually create the expression matrix. Okay, we can be Q to please. Okay, so back to the readme file. In the readme file, I have a proposed solution, a way to create a heat map. We're going to use R for that. And the comments we're going to be using in R are very simple. If you never work on R, 
I make this image so that all the dependencies are ready to go. That makes it easier for you to start learning because compiling these things may take some time and does not necessarily work perfectly every time you try it. But what we are going to try to do is we're going to try to read some data from a CSV file. We are going to transform that data into a matrix and then we are going to create a heat map and observe what's inside. Just that, okay? Everybody that works in with R has a different way that they prefer how to do it. I like to be as simple as possible. So normally I like to actually work from scripts um, and I have one ready here. So this is Get It, it's a text editor. And in R, if you see a hashtag, that's a comment. And if you are working on R, I suggest you to put a lot of comments so you can understand exactly what's in there. I like to work on scripts. And if you are starting working on computer programs and bioinformatics, I suggest you do the same. If you can create a script to do something, that's often better than just typing things on your terminal window. It's, always, it's also easier to execute. Normally, a script like this starts with something that we call the shebang. This line tells the computer which kind of program can read this file. Now, there's a lot of things to learn about how to write shebangs, so we're not going to get into that. In here, just notice that this is something that is going to be executed by something called R script. To read the file in R, we use read CSV, which is a function to read CSV files. It's actually super easy to work on R if you do it step by step and you learn it very slowly. Just don't rush. This function requires you to sell what's the name of the file you want to read. Um, and you may or may not say that the file has a header. And you may or may not indicate that this matrix, this table, contains row names. In our case, it does contain row names. One indicates that first row contains row names, and they indicate the genes. They're going to read that into a variable called data. I am speaking slowly and making some pauses on purpose to give you time to raise your hand or speak to me. But remember, I'm not actually paying too much attention to the Zoom window, so try to make some sound uh, so I know that I can stop and give you information if you need any. This is how we read data in July. Okay, once we read that data, it's not a matrix yet. R requires you to actually transform that table into a type of variable, a type of matrix. And you can do that with the function data matrix. Notice that there is a pattern here. We have a function name and something like options within parentheses, right? So this data here comes here, okay? Um, and we're going to read more lines that are empty. So this is so we can read more empty lines with NA and some data. And that matrix is going to be read and stored into a variable called matrix map. Next, we are going to plot a heat map. So the heat map can be plotted from a data matrix map with the function heat map. This is the function, and map is the variable we are giving to the function. It's simple as that. And what about lines 10 and 12? This is just so that instead of printing this and plotting it to my screen, I am sending this to a PDF file. I'm opening the PDF file with this comment, PDF, heatmap.pdf, which is going to be the name of the output file. I'm closing the file like so. I always recommend you closing everything, every file that you open in a computer program. I also recommend that when you write a script, you make it end with a quit or exit or something, whatever the, that language uses to put this script. Okay. So this is the script we're gonna run. This is my terminal window. I can use pwd to check if I'm in the right place. I can use ls to list the contents of this thing. And I can read the file with less heatmap R, right? Let's execute it. I'm gonna show you two ways to execute stuff on R without using anything else besides your terminal window. It's my preferred way to do it. There are other ways. There are actually programs that help you execute in R that I don't want to use. 
In my case, the first thing I want to do, the first example is doing this by calling R. So I just type it R, enter, and now in, in R, this is R version 4. And I'm going to start working. So the first thing I want to do is to read the data. So I'm going to copy this here. Ooh, I failed terribly. Here we go. Once I read something in R, I can check out what's inside the variable by typing its name. In this case, it's pretty large. There are other tricks that I can do, like for example, had data. That shows just a part of that function. Had means the first chunk of information. There's tail as well, shows to the end of the file. So this is the data matrix. R already has it. We need to transform into a matrix. So I'm going to copy this line. Done. Let's see. Here we go. And it looks the same, but now it has been converted into a data matrix. And R knows that. So it's easier for us to work on. If I just execute the heat map, done. In this case, I'm not printing it in a PDF. I am on purpose showing it on my screen. Now, this is far from a complete RNA-seq analysis. This is, is an extreme simplification of how to get a heat map. And the main purpose is just to, if you never saw how to execute these things before, now you know it. And most of the time when we are working with RNA sequencing of, or the bioinformatic thing is, you are basically just copying lines and pasting them somewhere often just changing the variables that you need to change, right? So it's, I, I hope that you found it fine, uh, easy because I think it's easy. Okay, let me quit. I'm gonna save it. There is another way to execute a script, right? Instead of copying and pasting it all the time. In the case of R, I like to use R script. So I can do R script, hit map, and then this line will execute this script right here. I hope that you are seeing me hovering my mouse around. Done. This is a message that is produced by the common tab.off that closes the PDF file. Now, if I list the contents of the directory, I see that there is a PDF inside. This is the PDF that was generated with the heat map inside. Okay. Now, this data has not been normalized at all. Um, and you should not trust the results whatsoever because it's just too simplified. But note that what I did here was I created a clusterization of the data using a quote unquote cladistics approach. Cladistics approach because it creates clades, it creates groups inside groups. So it's a, a hierarchical clusterization. And then I see for different genes some of the expression profiles that I have. Okay, so this is the first thing I want to show you guys. If anybody has any questions, let me know. Otherwise, you can play on this by yourself later, and then I go move on a complex thing next. I like to close everything and start from scratch so that you can understand exactly what I'm doing. So, new exercise. Let's work on this reference alignment exercise. I have a readme file here and the data is in here. And now we have a lot of data, okay? So this is a bit more interesting. And it comes with a .sh pipeline. This is a bash script to execute everything. And we want to understand what this does. If I go to that readme file, I have some explanation of what's going on here, okay? Note that I have a challenge for you guys later that you can try to play by yourself when you have the time. So what we want to do is we want to align the RNA sequence uh, reads that we have here from different points, uh, time points to the Strike Poly reference genome. And the most important thing to do, to do is to localize, to find where the reference genome is, E. coli.fasta, and to find where um, 
the reads are and understand how these reads are written. All these reads in this exercise are 50 base pair long uh, and they, they come from fragments of 200 base pairs and they are pairing reads, which means that the molecule had 200 base pairs more or less and you are sequencing 50 base pairs from each end and we're putting that those those sequences in these files. Okay. Um, what we want to do is to produce some alignments, variant information, and information about the coverage across the genome. So we know how many reads align to which different gene. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna open this in my terminal. I'm gonna check where I am. So I'm home, bioinformatics desktop, reference alignment. Now list the contents. Again, everything looks fine and the data is here. Let's go there. For me to change a directory, I use CD or change directory and then I give the path to that directory. This is where I am. This is what's inside. In the first a part of this workshop, somebody asked me about how these reads files look like. So let's take a look. I'm going to use this comment here, which is going to read the first four lines of a file. I'm going to read the first four lines of this file right here. These are all simulated data. They are fake. That's why they look like this. Uh, PASQ file, um, it starts with at and a header then we have the sequence, the nucleotide sequence. Then we may have a plus sign and the header or just the plus sign. So this information that I'm selecting here could be repeated in here or not. Normally we do not repeat this information again, just to save this space. The final line is the quality score. It's coded. Each one symbol here can be decoded into a value and that value indicates how good um, the quality of that one particular base is. That's why it's called a fast Q. The Q stands for quality. If I hit up and I change this to two, here we go. So this is from t1.1.fq. This is for t1.2.fq. Note that in here, the only difference between this header and this one is that this has a slash one, this has a slash two. Formats vary a lot. I don't wanna focus on this today, uh, uh, but they are paired files. Um, and I know that not only because their headers match, but also because in pair and files, the first, the first read from the first file matches the first read from the second file. They are in order, just like that, okay? So this is the input data that we're gonna have. We have different time uh, points. So each pair of PASQ files would represent in this case, one of those time points. Okay, now let's look into the batch script that I put together for this. Note that Shebang is calling for bash. That's how I know this is a bash script. Also because .sh uh, indicates it's a bash script. Note that I also quit this script here. It's a different language, so I'm using exit. Um, and I have something that is called a for loop here. I'm gonna do something uh, from one to a certain number, okay? So for i in one, two, this is a range. I could make this range, for example, one to 10, if I wanted to, like this, okay? So I'm gonna do something in a range. Otherwise I will have to do it manually or, tie, or, or change the values of Y by myself. Let's take a look very quickly on those work, how this works. For I in one ten, do echo Y done. So what I did here was I used the for loop that always has the same structure for something, do something, done. It's always like this. And in this case, I am using echo to print something in my screen. And what I'm printing is the value of this variable y. When I'm calling a variable, I use the dollar sign. 
and I pull it between curly braces to make it more obvious that it's a variable. There you go. Right, so this is what we're doing here. And we are doing a series of operations that aims to produce uh, a series of outputs. We're going to align our reads back to a reference and we're going to generate some statistics out of that reference. We are going to need that as the first step towards getting an expression data for this experiment. Okay, so let me put this here. Fantastic. So when I execute this this way, the first value of y will be one, the last value of y will be 10. Every time you see this, uh, you will be replacing y by its corresponding value for that part of the group. Another frequent comment that you see here is weight. This is just to be extra sure that the script is waiting for this to complete before moving to the next step. When you're listening to this recording and taking notes later on, you're also going to mind uh, a keyword here that's called redirection. And here I'm redirecting the standard output into a file. And I do that by using this gradient sign. I could redirect the standard error into a file by doing something like this. And you're gonna want, if you start working this kind of stuff, you're gonna want to learn how to redirect files. So what you want to study and research in Google is how to redirect the standard output and the standard error. Okay. So in this case, whatever was going to be printed into my screen is automatically being saved into this file. In the first stage, I'm using a liner. It's called BWA. Uh, it's based on the Boris Wheeler transformation of that time. And this, uh, this aligner contains several functions, several arguments. One of them is mem, and this helps me align pair and data to a reference. The reference is this one that's located here. I have several files. The reference is in here. Let's read the beginning of the reference. There you go. A simple FASTA file. FASTA files have headers that starts with a greater than sign and then the sequence ID, and then we have the molecular sequence here. Okay, so we downloaded a reference that was available to us. And in this example, we have this model organism and we are basing our exercises on the reference genome of that model organism. Okay, how does BWA works? So BWA is already installed. I can use the argument, the argument mem to align stuff to the E. coli genome. I'm gonna start aligning this. Pair one, pair two, and all this is going to be saved into a line underscore one dot sam. Sam is a type of align, uh, alignment format. There is another one that you're going to see here that's called BAM. SAM is text and you can read. BAM is binary, it's compressed. It takes less space, but it's not human readable. Okay. So if I execute this, I should be able to produce a SAM alignment. I failed to produce an index for this file. BWA, mem, E. coli, and the index file is missing. Let me fix that for you guys. Just the moment. Let me see if I can find it in my notes. Um, super Never? quick, I yeah. think on line four of your script, you index the E. coli FASTA file, and I think that's what it's looking for. Oh, yeah, that's exactly it. Thank you. I was yep. looking for this. Let's continue from here. Okay, what is the index? The index is a way for us to, for EWA to be able to read the basic information it needs from the reference file without having to go through the entire reference again. Okay. So PWA index here. We go. Okay, so every time that you execute this on your own computers, the time will be different depending on how many resources you allocated to this image. And again, if you have questions about how to allocate resources to your image, let me know later. 
when you do this, you create a few files um, into the background so you can see them here. Oh, here we go. This one, this one, all the files there are e. coli dot fa for pasta dot something else. Those are part of this index file. Now I can use the up arrow. Ah, here we go. So this should work now. Now, because this file is very small, it aligns it very quickly, and then we can read the alignment like so. Right? This is not supposed for you to, to, to read it with the human eye, although you can. And here we go. This is how the sum file looks like. Okay. Once we get that going, the sum file going, normally if you are working in a very large um, uh, data set, you don't want to be toying with some files because they can become very, very large. They take a lot of disk space. So instead you can be working with a band file, which is complex, it's just smaller. And one way for you to convert the same file into a, uh, the same alignment to a bond alignment is like this. You use a tool called SAM tools. Also, I believe I already installed everything. Let's see. So in here, what I'm doing is, since I am executing this by hand, I'm changing the variable y manually to the number of one. And as you can see, I'm using the program sum tools with the argument view. All of these things, I never memorized this stuff whatsoever, just as I never memorized how to build an index. It's absolutely useless to be memorizing that. When we're working with this data, like a lot, while we were working on that, you end up memorizing it because you are constantly using it. But there are so many different programs that you are using all day long uh, for different purposes that what you want to do is to keep notes uh, of all these comments. And one way that I like to, to do is to have examples exercises just like this. And I always go back to them and I just change that code. So if you are not a computer programmer and if you don't like programming a lot, it's still it should be reasonably simple for you after some time to just be changing these files and just editing, tweaking the, the variables that you need to change, right? So in this case, this is, these are the arguments that the manual consent tools tell me that I need to use to convert a SEM file, a SEM alignment into a bound alignment. If I just execute this, it would print the pen alignment into my standard output, which is my screen, but I don't want to have it in my screen. I want it into a file. So I'm redirecting it to a file with this thing here. Okay. Let's check it. Oh, here we go. This failed, and this is the file. And it failed because the name here doesn't match this name here. Let me just fix the comment. Here. Okay, it's align Sam to align um, dot fan. Out of curiosity, if you guys work a lot with Windows computer, I always have students that get confused about the extensions. Um, Windows users that are not used to code a lot, they get confused about those extensions. For example, FQ stands for fast Q. You could actually write F A S T Q instead of this. Uh, but the point is that when we're working from the Unix computer, the extension is basically just part of the name and you can write whatever you want in there. It doesn't matter. It's just important that you keep organized so you know what the extensions mean. So uh, the suffix and the prefix of the file, they can be whatever you want, provided that you understand what they are. Okay, now if I try to read the band file, I say this because it's binary, so I can no longer read it, okay? But it's, it occupies less disk space. So if I'm working from a cluster and I'm concerned about saving disk space, I could erase the send file right now and just keep the bound file. Okay, now the bound file needs to be sorted for us to do downstream analysis. And we do it with a, that comment. So some tools, sort, align one dot bam. And in this case, instead of redirecting the standard output, 
this thing has an argument to print the standard output for us. So minus O will indicate where we want to save the output. And we're gonna save it to a line one sorted dot pen. I also quick because again, a small file. I can also not read what's inside a line one sorted pen because it's binary, but I kind of know it worked because the computer did not scream at me. I don't see an error message, that's what I mean. Okay, and from here, uh, the next thing is I want to index this, the pen file. I'm indexing the pen file for a similar reason why I'm indexing, I indexed the, the Skate Kia Coli alignment in the beginning. So I'm doing this so it's faster for the computer to pass through the information stored in that file. For me to index a file, I do some tools, index, align, one, sort it down. So if I check, if I list the contents of this directory here, this is the file, the original band file, this is the sorted band file, and this is the index of the sorted band file. And from now, what I can do is start counting the number of reads, how many reads align to different parts of this genome. There are many, many ways to do this. And this comment line specifically, it changes very frequently with new versions of some tools and uh, its fellow partner programs like PCF tools. But for the version we have in this computer, we are going to use this command line right here. It's actually two command lines back together with a pipe. In the first pipe part, I'm using PCF tools, the option MPI uh, and pile up. I'm reading the E. coli genome and the bump file. And then I'm piping the result. So this will make me, allow me to work with the standard output from this thing that I'm passing automatically to another comment. And this is the second part of the comment. I'm using PCF tools to call information from that alignment. This information you never memorize, you get it from uh, the manual which describes in detail what this means and it's beyond the scope of this exercise. And that's going to print something to the standard to the output. This is how I indicate the output. It's going to be a VCF file, which contains the variance information. So this is a variant column for me. Okay, so if I'm going to execute this, I'm going to copy this thing here. I'm going to change a few things, right? This is one sorted. And this is also one sorted. Yeah, let's see if this works. Now I can try to read the VCF file like so. Less VCF. Okay, and this file contains information about different variations in that genome. So I have the reference genome and I know in which points my reads indicate vari variation to that original sequence. And we are not done yet. From this file here, we can get information like different alleles. And then we move on to a whole different rabbit hole for variant column analysis. One Another thing that we frequently want to do is to get the information about coverage per position. And we can do that with some tools, death. So the word death or the word coverage, those words often indicate reads aligned to different positions, okay? So for me to get the death, I go some tools, death, align, one sorted bam you cannot see my keyboard but i'm what i'm doing is i'm often hitting tab so that it auto completes it tries to complete for me so i don't have to type everything copying stuff and not and using tab and trying your best to not be typing yourself is awesome because whatever one space or single comma that you type out of place will make this uh, great it's not going to work so align one 
sort it back what is ext. Okay, so again, I'm using the strategy of redirect to redirect the standard output into a text file in this case. Let's see if this works. Here we go. So now we have the name of the reference file. This is the sequence ID. We have uh, information about different positions and how many reads are aligned to those positions. And so it's very long. Okay, and what do we do from this? Well, lots of stuff. We're gonna see another exercise in which we have this data already parsed. Uh, at this stage, often what you do is apply some kind of R script or Python script to convert that information into read counts per gene. In this exercise, the challenge would be for you to use this file here. Oh, it's easier for me to use this one. Um, there's a file called PTT. Here we go. This file here contains the location of different genes. So a bioinformatician could use the information about where the genes start and end, and also the information about the strand to match this information with how many reads we just found aligned to this position. If this position corresponds to a particular gene, that's how we get the number of reads that are left to this gene. So by parsing a combination of this file that comes from the annotation of the reference genome with the read counts that we just produced, we get to the initial counts table. Okay? If you want to know more about this exercise, again, remember that we have a written file explaining what's inside. And if you want to keep going from this stage, we have a challenge here and we will talk about how to actually do this later. Again, I'm going to jump, I'm going to stop here and jump to a more advanced part of the exercise in which I already have the expression table ready from somewhere else because it takes some time to calculate like. And again, please stop me while I'm doing this if you have any questions. Oh. Um, I have yes. a question. Um, so Oops. before you close your script, um, <laughs> so I just want to make sure I understand the whole process. So mm -hmm. the original files you have, the, the FQ files, so they are transcripts from a single sample. Is that correct? No. FASTQ files are read files. The reads are the sequences that were produced by a high to proof sequencing machine. Mm -hmm. So those are not the transcripts yet, but they can be aligned to become the transcripts. In this exercise, we were being lazy. We were aligning those sequences to a complete ref a reference genome of script recording. Normally what we do is to use a combination of de novo and reference approaches to align the reads back to um, RNA sequences. And those align RNA sequences, they represent individual transcripts that may be completed or not. Do you follow me? Uh, sort of. So the, the FQ files are not necessarily a product of RNA reads. They could be also genes instead of transcripts. Oh, I see what you are, what's your confusion. So let me show you this one file. T1.1, here we go. So you see, each read here is too short it, and it has the same length. It does not represent complete RNA sequences. But, and also you see a T here instead of a U, which indicates that this is DNA, not RNA. So what happened was that you had our, an RNA sample and from your RNA sample, you fragmented the RNA sample, attached the doctors, prepared the library, sent it to a sequencing facility Somebody sequenced this data for you and, and you got back some FASTQ files. Those sequences come from RNA that was converted into double-stranded DNA because double-stranded DNA is more stable and easier to manipulate, right? But if you want to make this into RNA, you just have to change the T's by use and that will be the same thing. So when I realign this and I rebuild this puzzle into sequences, those sequences will be the transcripts. 
which represent either complete or partial RNA fragments. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, and eventually in the end of your script, um, your coverage for each read is what is gonna tell you basically how much each transcript is expressed because if it has more reads, it means more fragments of it were present in the sample, is that? Yes, okay, precisely. Perfect. So the logic would be that there is some correlation between what is more abundant in your example will also be converted into more reads, right? The more RNA you have, the more reads aligning to that piece of RNA you're gonna get in the end. There are many reasons why that is not exactly the case, which is why we use strategies such as normalization protocols, which I'm gonna show you next. Um, but yeah, so minimally what we wanna imagine is that what we are doing is just counting the number of reads that align to certain genes. Mm -hmm. And then we normalize that data so we can compare that across samples. But ultimately the data comes from reads aligned to genes. Right, or reads aligned to RNA sequences that come from genes. Does that make sense? Yep, it does. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And although the part of the normalization is a bit complex because we're going to start talking about some logarithm functions and all that now, um, the, the, the basic process is just this. And of course, I'm, I'm on purpose is keeping the part of transforming this DAP table into uh, the actual expression data just to save time, right? Um, but you, I, I could potentially transform this into the expression table using the annotations from the reference file, which is here. But what I forgot to show you guys, and it's very important, is that you can execute the same script instead of the copying and pasting and changing the variables by hand, you can actually execute it. To execute a bash script, you just go bash and then call the name of the script, which in this case is called pipeline. All right? Let me save this. So bash pipeline. If you want to save the standard output, you can do like so std out dot txt if you want to save the standard error you can do like this std error dot txt um and and there are variations to make this more complex in this case the script has uh it was one to two in the beginning and that's on purpose just to make it faster right so it's not going to line everything this is just some i can show you how this is executed so when i hit enter it's going to take a while while it's running all of that process and it's saving all the standard output and the standard error into these files, right? And there are different ways that you can execute this. I'm doing this like this because I'm in this computer and I'm, 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 I intend to be waiting for the process to finish. But I could actually send this to the background and execute it and turn off, uh, uh, turn off my connection to this computer, do something else, get back and just check the results. Um, and if you want to know how to do that, that's the topic for another time, but you can ask me or, uh, or you can just search it online. It's not very hard. For example, in this case, if I wanted to just send this to the background, I could execute like this. I put a no hook in the beginning and I end with an percent and this send it to the background. And I know it's in the background because I have now the process ID that I can use to, for example, if I want to kill it, I can do it like this, right? So many oh q minus nine and the file right so that's the kind of process that you need to learn how to execute but for executing the exercises this is sufficient so you could potentially just do this bash pipeline execute and then wait okay i'm hitting ctrl c many times uh that's what you are seeing here this is just to kill the process so we can move on to do other stuff when I hit CG, I go to the, the root directory of this computer. I don't need to do that. I'm just going to close and open everything again. Uh, you... May I also ask a question? Yes, please. You should. Uh, uh, in the process that you demonstrated, uh, didn't for some reason include uh, quality control. And I wonder yeah. whether you can do without that, or if not, uh, would you show us a way to do it for quality control and training? Quality control was polemic back in the day, and nowadays is understood as something extremely important. The data that I was using just now was a simulation. And as I explained in the first part of this workshop, I imagined this uh, following a, a protocol in which you would get most of the data ready to go from the sequencing facility, which is becoming the standard nowadays. 
However, yes, if the SQL Simplicity is not performing the trimming of your data, uh, you should perform quality control yourself in your computer. And no, yes. I did not prepare how to do this today because of time. I much rather show you how to execute an, uh, an actual gene expression analysis next uh, in the final minutes that we have. But if you want me to talk to you about how to do that in your computer at home, I can point you towards uh, the papers and the codes to do it. I actually have at least two papers in which there is a there there there's a protocol that comes as supplementary digital material to those papers that you can follow step by step to trim your data. That's complex, so that we could have an entire workshop on how to to process the data, uh, and that would require many hours. Okay, so sorry to be too thank you, but oh, please let you. me know if you want to talk about this. You, uh, we can share emails about that topic or. We can even call each other at another moment, and I, 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 I show you how to do it. Okay. Uh, now, Thank you so much. no, you're welcome. Now, moving on. Um, every time that I prepare workshops like this, I don't like to hurry, and I like to have more exercises than I actually gonna have time to show. That's on purpose. The idea is to have materials that you can toy by yourself and try to show as much as as I can uh, during the time that we have together. So you're gonna see that I have data from National Data 2020. This is from the actual data that I produced. This, this takes some time to execute. I have also uh, this Edge R protocol right here. I'm skipping that. I'm focusing on this for, for, for today's workshop, okay? Uh, but note that all the other ones come with readme files for you to execute what's inside and understand what's in there. We're now going to focus on DSEC2, which is one of the most commonly used programs to process expression data. And as, all, as usual, we have a readme file here, right? In this case, I'm just saying that the source of data comes from this uh, URL, and there is a reference here. You can visit this website to get more information. Alternatively, you can read the information directly from this script. I made some comments explaining what it does. Also, you can open the source PDF in which you see information about the Sephoria and what we are going to do next. Okay, so many ways that you can study this by yourself. The data comes here, as you can see, it's fairly large. I'm going to focus on this script and what it does, and then I'm going to execute it to show you how to perform it, okay? So again, what we need to do here is we can open a terminal by right-clicking in the folder, right-click, open terminal, and then we check to see if we are in the right place, we see the contents, everything sounds fine. This is the script. GSEC2 is a library. We use lots of libraries in R to process RNA seq data, and we can load those libraries like so. So library and the name of the library. Installing them may be kind of painful, not always, but until you get the hang of it, it's complex, especially because some depend, have a lot of dependencies and they may or may not come together uh, and, and, and work properly when you try to install it all at once the first time. Um, another thing, because I'm working with a, a lot of different files, uh, in this case, I'm being extra careful when I'm setting the working directory with the command set wd, on which I'm pointing to this location. See, this thing here matches this location. Right? For this exercise, we are going to get data that's already prepared. So we're gonna see accounts table. So from that table that we produced before with the number of reads aligned to each position, we can generate this type of table. And from the annotation of the genome, we can produce the metadata table. Let's start by looking to how these things are in real life. Okay, so this is the count table. We have each line representing a gene and each column representing a different experiment. Because this is from data that has been deposited somewhere else, what you're seeing here is the ID for that sequencing project on NCBI. These values here represent the count table, right? So each one of them separated by commas. 
And this is the first step towards producing a gene expression analysis. So again, what you need to do is to have your experiments as columns, your genes as lines, and each cell contains the number of weeds that align to that position. What about the metadata? In this case, we have the IT, information about the treatment, cell type. Uh, so again, this SSR is because this data is deposited somewhere else. I indicated it comes from the control or from treatment group. I indicated the number of the sample. So because it takes some time to organize, I'm, 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 I'm showing to you how it looks like instead of producing it from scratch. And what I need to do to process this data in the set two is, uh, is to follow a protocol that does not have a lot of steps actually. Uh, most of these lines node are either empty lines or comments explaining what I'm doing, okay? So the first part is to convert the count data that comes from here. See, I'm reading the count table, a CSV file into count data, and I'm reading the metadata into the metadata variable. And now I'm using the count data and the metadata to produce this variable called DGS, which is this DSEC, uh, DSEC data set object. So this is a, a way to store all of that information together in the same variable using this function. I did not need to do anything else here if I'm using this for another data set other than just changing the names of these files. And this stays the same, right? So the first part is just construct this DSEC data set object, which will be called DGS. Instead of, I will execute this line by line so you can see how it looks like. So I'm loading R and library. It takes a while because it's a large one. ggplot2 is my favorite library to plot stuff. I'm gonna guarantee that R knows where I am and where the data is. Then I'll load the count data first. Again, if I wanna see what's inside, I can just type the name of the variable here. It's a lot. I also gonna load the metadata. Here's how it looks like. Once that's done, I execute this. Note that R allows me to break the line here to just to improve the ability, but if I write this in a single line, it works just as well. Right, so this is the one. What I need to do is I need to point out what's the count data and what's the metadata. If it's formatted like this, I don't need to worry about anything else. A lot of people waste a lot of time in R trying to format the data inside R to make it fit the format, the, the function. I highly recommend that you do not do that. Instead, you, you either manually format these files or you learn how to, to do that automatically using Python scripts so that you always feed R with files that are formatted just like the functions want them to be formatted. And that saves a lot of time. Once I have this thing here, I need to estimate a few things. I need to do some calculations. I will execute it first and explain what it's doing later. So what I'm doing here is I am normalizing the data in a way that I can understand the variation within samples, taking into account the fact that many factors, many biases will make some samples have more weeds than others. And one way to do that is to work with logarithms and averages of logarithms. And the cool thing about working with averages of logarithms is that outliers do not affect them as much as regular uh, uh, averages, regular means, right? And of course, this part here with just this comment, what I did was I estimated the size factors. I will multiply the values of the counts of each read by those size factors uh, so that values can be compared across columns. I estimated dispersion values. 
uh, I estimated the mean dispersion relationship, the final dispersion estimates, and I fitted the model all with this one single sequence here. And now, of course, what you want to do is to understand this as best as possible. But somebody did a better job than me to explain all these steps. That's where that playlist of RNA-seq videos comes handy. There is a two-part video in there explaining what DSEC is doing with a step-by-step -step explanation of how the logarithms are being calculated. But the cool thing is that this is so simple to execute that if you understand the basics, you just need to do all these calculations by running this simple format. Okay? So understanding the sec is later. Understanding how to execute it comes first. Just execute this. Once I produce the DDS file, I need to produce the results table. Sometimes in R, we have to execute small functions that just prepare the files to be read in a certain way so that other functions can read them. This is how the results look like. So we have information about the log code change and p values for all of them. All, everything is already calculated and ready to go. I can take a look into the results in different ways. For example, I can use the common head. This is just me showing the same results in two different ways, okay? So once you produce that file with the counts, DSEC2 or other programs do everything else by themselves. I can also summarize all the results like so. Note that nothing here is doing anything with the data. I'm just showing you the data. I can reorder all the results based on uh, p-values, which I need to do. And now the results will look a bit different because they are reordered, but the same files are here. And then I can just start printing this information into PDF files. So I can print the counts, create a volcano plot, um, and create a PCA analysis. Now, because this includes creating files and I prefer to show them to you as PDF files, I'm not going to execute it here. I'm going to explain it here and then execute the entire script, okay? So the PDF file, I open the PDF file here, I close it here, and then I'm printing information with these plot counts for specific genes that I am interested in. In this example, I know all of those genes. So I imagine a situation in which I know the reference genome and I know what are my genes of interest. For the volcano plot, the most important thing in this value, in this variable is just to change the name of the variable of your results. So this here comes from here, right? If you change this for any way, you're going to need to change the value here. Otherwise, you don't need to change anything else. All the other values, you just leave them as they are. Nothing else going to change. And for the PCA analysis, the actual plots produced with plot PCA, um, and you use the variable VS data for that, which you produce with the VST comment line based on DDS. DDS comes from up here. So you see, if you are using this thing again for your own analysis, you should only need to change this line here to indicate what's your counts table and this line here to point out your metadata. And in theory, you don't need to change anything else in the entire file. How would I execute this completely? No. So to execute an R script, I do R script example R. Now it's loading everything and printing everything to the standard output because I did not redirect the standard output to anywhere else. So while it's producing that analysis, I can see everything that's going on in my screen. While we are undergoing the process of actually executing RNA seq experiments, we are often just copying the scripts from somebody else and re-executing them again. And although it's key for us to understand everything that the problem is doing, 
actually making it happen is not that hard. And the focus of today's workshop is part two, was just to show you how we can execute those very simple functions. So it's more tangible and you can have a better grasp on what kind of actual stuff we can do and how it actually looks like. If I go back to my directory, I produce the accounts information here for a few genes. So we have the normalized count values here, and we have the comparison between the control and the treatment for each gene. So we can see, for example, that in this case, the treatment has more of that gene than the control. And the same goes here. So those would be upregulated. And here, the control has more gene than the treatment. This would be downregulated. And this is interesting if you are aiming towards checking out specific genes of interest. What else? If you look into the volcano plot, you can you can see the, 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 the genes that are highly expressed um, in different thresholds that are marked by blue or red. So blue is less differently expressed than red. Red are extreme values. Uh, you may decide to use different cutoffs uh, and ignore, for example, all the red dots and focus on the blue dots, depending on many different things and how to choose the cutoffs. That's very hard and very arbitrary. We had some discussion about that last week. So I put one video as well uh, showing how to make decisions about the cutoffs by combining results from DSEC experiments and also from edge R experiments. Ideally, you should not be using only one of those tools to make decisions about your data, but actually comparing different tools and see how those different tools affect your results so that you can get to a more conservative approach. A few parts of this process are arbitrary and therefore I, su I strongly suggest that you always try to come up with a conservative strategy. It's better to be safe than sorry. Okay, so this is all that I wanted to show in this on today's workshop. The data is here. And again, you can download the image with the exercises from here. If you wanna understand what each of those directories do, just go inside those directories and see the readme files. This image also comes with Trinity, uh, Trinity, which is in here. Trinity is a complete pipeline for transcriptome analysis. If you go into here, you will find the Trinity example data. Right? So you can you can try out and see how it looks like from here. You can also come here. Sample data. Here. You can also come here inside test Trinity. And if you want to check out how a complete run from a, a read alignment to ex, a gene, a differential gene expression analysis works, you can just execute the runme.sh that comes with the, the problem, like so. And in my case, it ran very fast because it's completed. And once it's completed, you're gonna see stuff like, for example, less So these are actual transcripts that were assembled de novo. So if you want to execute this by yourself, you will see that this pipeline will generate files of different lamps that represents different RNA sequences, actual RNA sequences. And the gene expression analysis comes from aligning the reads back to these transcripts and counting how many of those reads align to each of these transcripts. Normally, we know what some of those transcripts are because we align them back to databases and we can name those files. But many times we don't know what they are and that's part of gene discovery, the gene scoping process. 
Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you for your attention. As we did the last time, I'm going to be on the line while people have things to ask me. Take your time. Can I help anybody with any questions at this moment? I, uh, I did have a brief question. I Please. wanted to know if with most sequencing runs, the data you get back from the facility is going to be FASTA files, or does it depend? Most of the times you're gonna get FASTQ files for hard to prove sequencing experiments, plus other statistics. The main file that you receive from a sequencing facility when you are using next generation sequencing, um, like in Lumina machine, is a FASTQ file. Um, in the case of uh, the DHMRI here at Charlotte, uh, it's not Charlotte actually, I think it's Charlotte, it's close by, it's, it's, an, it's a sequencing facility associated with the NUNC system. I get a lot of my data from those guys. I can decide whether I pay for bioinformatics services in which they give it to me already, everything assembled and ready to go, including the gene count staple, or if I want to do it by myself. And the difference is just whether or not I want to save some money. If I want them to produce the data and give me just the files that I need to execute on R later on, they do that, but they charge me extra for that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and there are actually several different courses online explaining how to process that data that you get from sequencing facilities if you need to save money. However, it's often faster if you can afford it to, to ask for them to do so. And it's becoming cheaper as well. So I believe that I, I know already a few labs that move towards asking for bioinformatics services from the sequencing facility so that they can save some time and also disk space. So they receive all the data already parsed and they don't need to worry about those intermediary files that we generate throughout uh, the first step of the analysis. What else? Hello, I have a question about the quality string in FASTQ mm -hmm. files. At, sure. what, at what stage um, does that get incorporated? Is there any, for example, today, is there any mm -hmm. set that we did today that incorporated information from that string? And if not, at what stage of quality control do we usually look at that information? No, not at all. We, we did not incorporate that today because we were assuming that we could trust all of the sequences. Right. Where okay. would we incorporate that information? If we are receiving raw data from the sequencing facility and we did not pay them to produce any kind of quality control analysis before sending the data to us, we will need to do that. How do we do it? We're going to use dedicated pipelines that were designed specifically for the sequencing technology that we used. Mm -hmm. The Lumina variant reads have a type of quality control protocol that we have to follow. Um, made fair sequences have another type of quality control we have to follow. Fact bio data have a different one. So it's very, the solutions are very specific to the type of data that you generated. However, although specific, they always come with handy programs that can do that for you. And they are not hard to execute. You just have, no, you have to remember to do so. And what is scary about this is that it could potentially receive crappy data with including adapters and sequences that are of low quality. And it could produce an entire transcriptome analysis and, and differential gene expression analysis with that data without producing any quality control. And the results would look something that would be very hard to tell apart from the results from a different experiment in which you actually did the quality control. It would be hard to see that there's a problem in the data, but of course the results will be very different when you apply quality control, right? So in, in, the, in the early stages, like 2008, from 2008 to 2012, there were even papers of people claiming that you could use their aligners and uh, assemble pipelines uh, to, to generate gene expression analysis or genome assemblies without worrying about quality control and that you could forget about quality control. And that was even better that it did that. And it took a while for the community to learn that that was a mistake and quality control is required. So it, 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 for a while, it was kind of 
a, a taboo topic was a bit polemic and it's no longer like that. So be okay. warned if you were reading a book like from 2000, 2012 to 2013, you might get people saying in that book or in that paper that they did not perform quality control or that they even don't like to do so. Uh, and then when you start reading papers from 2015 or, or earlier than that, then you see that 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 idea, there was a shift there in the community. Okay, and I'm assuming that you as the analyst can set the threshold for how strict the quality control is and and whatever you set it to is important to communicate that. And, and, and that threshold is always set like per the technology or is it really dependent on the context? That's a great question. So one of the things that bothers me a lot in all of these steps is when we have to make arbitrary decisions. Um, at that stage, and there, there are often a lot of arbitrary decisions we have to make. At those steps, the most important thing is to be very clear in your paper, in your material methods or supplementary additional material, which decisions you made, right? Even when you don't have a reason. So for example, a lot of people decide to go with default options of different problems because sometimes it's very hard to test different options because it takes some time, right? It requires disk space, computational resources, it may take a while. So it's not exactly feasible for you to, every time that you rerun an analysis, you try to optimize those values. It's very common that you go and follow somebody else's paper or the default values of the problem. And the only thing that matters at that stage would be for you to be very clear on which decisions you made so that people can replicate your analysis. In my case, I like to make the scripts available and I do not like to exactly use the default values. And even if I do so, I explicitly tell those values so that people do not get confused and can use exactly the same numbers or parameters that I'm using. And when I am worried about uh, a value that I think that is arbitrary, I normally try to make a decision that will make the analysis more conservative. So it would be hard. It would be harder for me to get a false positive. That's morally, normally what I try to do. And although okay. there are some statistics to help you out with that, it's not a lot. So at that stage, talking to an experienced bioinformatician helps. Um, that's when you want to have somebody to guide you through and to talk about some thresholds and discuss the results. It's very common that I get people uh, sending me emails, showing me their, their end results from a certain analysis and asking me, does this look okay? And that's very healthy to do. It's, it, it, you, you get a colleague and say, hey, do you mind taking a look and seeing if there's something weird here? Uh, because sometimes you do some quality control experiments in your lab and you throw away 25% of the data, but you have no idea if that's common or not, right? Mm -hmm. And with time and experience, we start getting a feeling for it. But again, it's still super arbitrary. Because of those arbitrary thresholds, what you can do to be more confident about your analysis? Well, the answer is replication. You replicate the libraries that you are preparing. You try to sequence as much of the data as possible so that you can feel free, quote unquote, to, to throw away more data if you need so and use uh, more strict thresholds so that you can be more confident in your results. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. And yeah, that's, that, that's the hardest part of this is just figuring out the thresholds. That's painful. What else? Uh, yes, for sequencing, how many rays uh, are enough for my purple? Awesome. Okay, so what you do is once you know what you are sequencing, mm -hmm. you, if you, especially if you are working with a model organism like mice, yeah, you want to try to compute the expected or the desired coverage. So what you do is you ask the sequencing facility to help you out, or whatever bioinformatician is helping you out with the analysis, and you ask that person or persons to help you calculate how many. How many sequencing? How much sequencing effort is required for you to reach a certain desired coverage? Coverage is about the number of read sequences we will align to different genes in your experiment. Depending on the type of experiment you are performing, 
you can follow certain guidelines for that coverage. So for example, for a luminous sequencing of model organisms in which reference genomes are available, you often want to aim for a coverage of at least 10 times. So on average, 10 reads aligned to each position or more. Um, and then you, you first calculate how much it's gonna cost you to do that, to get to 10 times coverage and that's an estimate, okay? But then you, 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 you quote for that estimate. And if you have more money, you're gonna try to make it more. So uh, I, am, I am a phylogeneticist, so I'm normally working with phylogenetic trees. And I often get a similar question when I'm thinking about phylogenetic trees, which is how much computational effort do I put to perform a phylogenetic analysis? And in the case of phylogenetic analysis, the answer is, it depends on how large my data set is and how long I, how, how much time I have, right? Because some of my genetic analysis can run in a cluster for a year. So I have to, I have to think about how long I have and how many resources I can spend on that analysis. That's the same thing for uh, all sequencing experiments. And when you try to make those estimates, for example, you decided that the type of experiment you want to perform requires a minimum of 10 times coverage. The sequencing facility can tell you based on the technologies they have available and the outputs of that particular machine, how many lanes, for example, of a Illumina machine you're gonna to need to sequence to get to that expected coverage. And they may also tell you that it would be best to, for example, if you want 10 times, you would like to, you would calculate as if you wanted 20 times because you expect losing 50% even quality control. And you, and you have, and it's hard, but that's the type of calculation you have to, to do. And you have to program yourself and be prepared for occasions in which the sequence comes back. And uh, although you get some usable sequences from there, you did not reach the desired coverage. And if you do not reach the desired coverage, you're gonna have to decide whether or not you do, you resequence the data again. So another very helpful thing at this stage would be, I always consider the idea of storing some of the input material, the RNA extraction, for example, if you need to resequence that in the future. I, I hope that the recording of the materials in here will help you guys moving forward on understanding how this kind of stuff works. This image, although not perfect, what is cool about it is that R is already installed Python 3 is already installed. The second edge R is already installed. Trinity is already in there. So a lot of the basic tools you need to perform basic exercises on RNA sequence analysis is already there. Also, because it's a virtual image, if you, if you do something that will crash the computer, it's absolutely fine because you can erase it and start from scratch. So in the beginning, when you were learning how to code, it's awesome to have some Kind of image, updated image like this available. So I hope you use it not only for the exercises that are here, but also just to keep learning bioinformatics and stuff. And please, everybody, um, uh, reach out and send me an email if you have any questions whatsoever that I can help you with. Thank you so much. Awesome, Dennis. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.